talk today about the whole reason that we come here. And that's Jesus. That's why I, I want to talk about Jesus today and what He did for us. You know, sometimes I wonder if we truly grasp exactly what He went through so that we could have salvation. I don't think we truly understand exactly what He did when He came to this earth for us. So the first thing we see in John 1.14, it says, The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So Jesus is God's Word born in the flesh. Why do you think everywhere Jesus went that He had people wanting to kill Him or get rid of Him? Because He was speaking God's Word. God's truth that He spoke in God's Word is meant to convict our hearts so that we will repent of our sins and turn away from them. People don't like the truth that Christ was speaking. That's what God's Word does. It convicts our heart to do right. And times have not changed. They figure it's easier to get rid and remove what convicts their hearts than to actually remove the sin and repent from it. So when Jesus is on this earth, born in the flesh, the, the Word is born in the flesh, and He's walking as He's getting older, and He's talking truth and speaking God's Word, they wanted to get rid of Him. They didn't like hearing the truth, just like today. In today's world, they have to remove the Ten Commandments from our courthouse. Remove God from the Pledge of Allegiance. Remove the cross from our city seals. Remove God from our schools in prayer. It's easier to remove God than it is to call ourselves a sinner and do something about it. So it's easier just to get rid of God. The reason they want to remove God is because just the word God in hearing it makes us think of His righteousness and holiness. So when we hear God, we think of His righteousness and His holiness, and when we're living in sin, that's the last thing we want to hear. We don't want to hear righteousness and holiness because it convicts our hearts. So to remove Him means there will be no conviction. So the world says, well, if we just take God out of everything, just like whenever Jesus is walking the earth in the flesh, and He's speaking truth and speaking God's Word, well, it's easier just to remove Him. It's easier to remove the things of God than to be convicted in our heart, because we don't like to be convicted. We, we, don't like, we don't like hearing God's Word speaking to our heart, saying, hey, you need to change this, or you need to change that, or you need to quit doing that. We don't like hearing that. We are in the flesh, and we want to live our life the way we want to live it. That's why we have to be crucified of the flesh. Let the flesh die, and let God's Spirit in us have free reign. Just as an example, let's talk about the Ten Commandments. Talking about removing God so that we don't have to be convicted. You have the Ten Commandments sitting in a courthouse, and you have these people fixing to go into court for stealing, robbing, whatever it is. And you're walking by the Ten Commandments and it's saying, Thou shalt not, thou shalt not. You don't want to see that. It reminds you that you do wrong. So it's easier just to get rid of them than it is to have to look at them and be convicted in your heart of what we shouldn't be doing. That's just an example of the Ten Commandments being removed from the courthouse. We don't want to have to look at it when we're going to court because we're going into a place to be judged for what we did on this earth. We'll be judged, all right, by God Himself. 
And it's not going to matter what some guy in a black robe says. It's going to be God doing the judging. But on this earth, we have to obey the laws of the land and we will have to face judgment in a courthouse. And whenever we're on our way to a courthouse to be judged, we don't want to look at the Ten Commandments saying how we did something wrong. So let's just get rid of it. Let's just remove it. That's the world's way of thinking. So Jesus was God's Word born in the flesh. And I just want to say right here that Jesus is the Son of God. There's a lot of people out there that say that He is not the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. And I don't know what Bibles they're reading from, but it's not the Bible that we read. It's throughout the whole Bible. God's Word says that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So I want to take a look at what exactly Jesus did for us. So to do that, we have to think about Jesus being born in the flesh. And something else I don't think that we realize when it comes to Jesus being born in the flesh is when He walked this earth, He felt pain just like we feel pain. He felt loneliness just like we feel loneliness sometimes. Every feeling that we've ever had in our life Jesus felt what it was like because He was in the flesh. But He overcame all of that. And we can overcome it too through Him. See, the Bible says He was made sin for He knew no sin. And we, don't, we can overcome sin through Him. If we put our trust and our faith through Jesus Christ and what He did for us, we can overcome that sin and that temptation. So everything that we feel as we live in the flesh, Jesus already felt that. That's why, that's why He knows what we're going through. He knows what we're feeling. He knows what it is to overcome whatever it is we're faced with. Because He's already been there. He's already overcome it. And as long as we put our faith and our trust in Him, we can overcome it also. So let's think back to when Jesus was born in a manger. Here's another one that we just take for granted. Jesus was born in the flesh. He felt everything that we feel. To be born in a manger. Well, first we have to understand for Him to be born in a manger, He was already in the heavens. Where he had everything. Streets of gold. Now we don't know what heaven's going to be like, but we do get a little peek of it. Streets of gold, no pain, no suffering, no tears, no illness, no sickness, nothing there to defile this city. So for Jesus to be born into this world in a manger, he had to be willing to give up all that. He had to be willing to leave a place where there is no pain and sorrow to come to a place where it's full of pain and sorrow. So there's just two little things right there that we don't even realize, we don't even think about. He was in the flesh. He felt what we've... Just imagine as we get more into the sermon the pain and suffering that He had to feel and go through for us because He was in the flesh. And then just to think that He was born in a manger meant that He had to leave a place where He was King of Kings and come to a place where nobody wanted Him. So He was willing to give all that up and He was willing to do that for us. So we have to understand, first of all, that Jesus was with God when God created the heavens and the earth. And we see in Genesis 1.26 when he, here's God, he, he's, he's creating the earth and everything on the earth and then He gets down to the creating man. And God said in verse 26, He said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. So this tells us that there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit when the earth and everything was created. 
God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It's called the Trinity. Three in one. They're all the same. <laughs> but yet they're all different. People say, explain that. I can't explain it. I can't explain that there's a God, or the, a God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three separate, yet they're all the same. That's why when you think of an egg, you think, explain it. I can't explain that either. You've got three separate parts of an egg. You've got the shell, the yolk, and the white. They're all separate, they're all different, but yet they're all the same in one. I can't explain that either. So you got God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and God said in, in that verse 26, He said, let us make man in our image. So we have to realize that Jesus was with the Father when all this was created. And yet He was willing to be born into this world. So if He's with the Father in the heavens, He's walking streets of gold, he, all these wonderful things in heaven, and yet He's willing to come down here and be born in a manger, and instead of walking on streets of gold, He's willing to walk on streets of cobblestone. A place where He is King of kings to where, like I said, nobody wanted Him. They wanted Him dead. For what? Well, because He spoke the Word of God. All He did was go and heal people. All He did was speak truth. All He did was perform miracles to help others, and yet they still wanted Him to die. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 8, 20, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay His head. So see, He came from a place where He had everything, and He came to a place where He said, I don't even have a place to lay down. He was willing to give everything up for us. I don't even think we as Christians even realize what He gave up just to come here. And yet He did it for you and for me. He did it for all of us. And then you hear people say, well, if God is such a loving God, why would He allow His own Son to die? Well, if you're asking that question, you're missing the whole point. If we have to ask why would God allow His Son to die if He's full of love and grace, you're missing the whole point. It's because of His love that He allowed His Son to die for us. We see in John 3.16 for, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. So, God so loved the world. There's that love. He loved us so much that He was willing to give us His Son. So when people say, well, if God loves so much, how would He let His own Son die like that? He, he loved us so much that He gave His Son. So there's the love. You're missing the whole point if you're asking that question. It's in John 3.16. So Jesus was willing to leave the heavens where He had everything to come to a place where He had absolutely nothing. He left a place where He is King of kings and came to a place where these earthly kings wanted Him dead because of the truth that He spoke. He left a place, a place of no pain or suffering and He was willing to come to a place to where He would face the ultimate pain and the ultimate suffering. And He did all this for you and for I. And see, when I think about that, when I think about what He did for us, you know, we say in some of the Scriptures, like, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, if you put your own name in there and make it personal, that, that if you call upon the name of the Lord, He died for you, that if you were the only person on this earth, He still would have come here and died so that you could have eternal life. 
when I think about what He did for me, and when I think about what He gave up and, and everything He went through so that I could have eternal life, that's why I want to serve God. I mean, why wouldn't I want to serve God after knowing what He did for me and everything that He went through? That's why I want to serve God with all of my heart. Christ died for the church. We should want to live for the church. And we are the church. If Christ died for me, then I should want to serve Him. I should want to live for Him. I should want to do everything in my power to make sure that I'm doing the best that I can as a, as a Christian. That's why when I see so-called Christians say they're a Christian, but yet they don't want to do anything for the Lord, and, and, and they're out living in the world, and they're, and they're pushing people away from God because they call themselves a Christian, but yet they sure don't act like a Christian in the way that they're living... It just grieves my spirit. It, it, it just doesn't settle well with me how we can call ourselves a Christian and live like the world lives. It just it, it does not sit right with me. God died for the, for the church. We ought to live for it. We ought to do everything we can to protect it. Christ did all of this for us And then there's so many Christians that act like going to church or living for the church, it's a burden. Going to church, it was too time consuming. <laughs> living to the church, it's too much responsibility. Don't want to have to give. Don't want to have to invest so much time or we come to church and we act like we have to go to church. We have to be there. We, it's Sunday morning. It's 11 o'clock. We have to go. When we're born again Christians and we realize what Jesus Christ did for us, we should want to go to church. We should want to give to the church. We should want to protect the church. We should want to live for the church. We should do everything in our power to reach out to others and bring them into the church because we know what Christ did for us. Why wouldn't we want to share that with others? It's a gift of God. And we should want to share that gift with others. And then when I think about Christians who think that church is a burden, too time consuming and all this, then I think about Christ carrying that cross to Mount Calvary, and I can't help but to wonder if it entered his mind, if it was a burden to him. I wonder if Christ carrying that cross to Mount Calvary, if he ever thought this is just too time consuming, or I have better things to do. What if he started carrying that cross to Mount Calvary and he said, you know what, I'm, I give up. I'm, and he just threw the cross off his back and called upon all the angels of heaven to come down and take him away. Where would we be at today? Well, we'd be on our way to hell. But because of his willingness to do all this for us, we have a way to eternal life. We have a way to heaven because of him. And because he died for us, we should want to live for him. Now I want to skip over to Matthew 27, verses 22 through 43. And just realize exactly. So, we, we know Jesus was with the Father when the, everything was created. We know that He was willing to give everything up when He was born in that manger. We know He was in the flesh, that He felt everything that we feel. But I want to skip over. This is where they actually have Jesus in custody and they're putting Him before the people. And can you imagine leaving the heavens and all those wonderful things that He had in heaven and willing to give all that up knowing what His future held for Him, knowing that He would face this death? 
and yet he was still willing to do it? As a matter of fact, if you think about it, when we think about Jesus being in the flesh and feeling things that we feel, we see Him pray that prayer that says, Father, if there's any other way, if there's any other way for this to happen, please let this cup pass from me. The cup of pain, the cup of loneliness, the cup of pain and suffering, facing that death, that horrible death. He was in the flesh. Haven't we ever gone through something and we went to God and we said, Lord, if there's any other way for this to work out, please let it happen because I don't want to have to do this. I don't want to have to stand up against this. Haven't we ever gone to God and prayed a prayer like that? Well, Jesus prayed that same prayer. If there's any other way for this to happen, please, please let it happen. Please remove this cup from me. But He also prayed, nevertheless, not my will be done, but thine will be done. In other words, God, Father, if there's not any other way to do this, it's not what I want to do, but it's what you need me to do. We have got to get to a point in our Christian life when we pray that same prayer. Lord, I don't, understand. I don't want to have to do it. I don't want to have to face this. I know there's going to be a lot of pain and a lot of things going on. If there's any other way, Lord, just remove it from me. But if there is no other way, then I'm willing. I'm willing to be used. We have, we've got to get to a point where we can say that and mean it. Well, there was no other way. There was no other way. So now we see Jesus standing before the people. And Pilate said unto them, what shall I do with Jesus, which is called Christ? And they all said, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil has he done? And they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. And when Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a torment was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. And then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. And then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scoured Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall, gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers, and they stripped him of his clothes and put on him a scarlet robe. And then they had plaited a crown of thorns, and they put it upon his head, and they reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him, and began mocking him, saying, Hell, king of the Jews. And they began to spit upon him, took the reed, and beat him on the head. And after that they had mocked him. They took the rope off of him, and put his own clothing on him, and led him away to be crucified. And then there came to a place called Golgotha, that is to say a place of a skull, and they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall, and when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And they crucified him, and they parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him and sent over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads, and saying, Thou that destroys the temple and built it in three days. Save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking him with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the King of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. So, 
Now we see Jesus standing before the people. He knew this was going to happen. He knew what His future held for Him. He knew He was coming down from the heavens where He had everything to a place He had nothing. He knew He was coming from a place where there is no pain and no suffering to face this day. He knew it was coming. So let's think about what He did. We already talked about what He gave up. We already talked about being in the flesh and feeling the pain and the suffering. But let's think about this part of it. Now He's standing before the crowd and what did He do? He healed people. He helped people. He saved people. He did miracles. And because of that truth that He did, that He spoke, now they want to kill Him. So they're willing to let a murderer go in order to kill Jesus, to crucify Him. So they, Pilate said, what, what should I do with Him? And they said, crucify Him. Can you imagine this whole group of people standing before Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, the one that we are here for today? Can you imagine this group of people standing before Him saying, crucify Him? And for what? He didn't do anything. Jesus came from a place where He felt no pain, a place where angels, He has authority over all. And now He's standing before a bunch of sinners. And we're part of that. It's our sin that nailed Him to the cross. Our sin, we are as guilty as the man that drove the spikes through His hands and through His feet. We are just as guilty as that Roman soldier that did that. Because it is also our sin that He died for on the cross. So now you have Jesus facing all these sinners, a righteous and holy man standing in front of a bunch of sinners knowing what His future was. And they're all, we're all saying, crucify Him. Our Lord and Savior is now being led down where they're ripping the clothes off of Him, where they're taking the crown of thorns and pressing it down upon His head. They don't just lay it on there and let it scratch His head. They press it down upon His head. Imagine the thorns digging into His forehead, into His head. The blood begins to drip down His face. The sweat, the heat, can you imagine what he went through? They ripped his clothes off of him. He's standing there naked and they put on a scarlet robe. And then they began to beat him in the head, began to spit on him, began to mock him. And they take him down and they tie him up and they began to beat him with the cat of nine tails which begins to rip the flesh from his body until he could not be recognized as a human being. This is what our Lord and Savior did for us. And then we act like we can't come to church. We act like we're doing too much and we just don't have time for Him. And yet look what He did for us. Do we even imagine, do we even grasp exactly what Jesus Christ did for us? Because we sure don't act like it in the way that we live our life. Every time we say, I don't want to go to church. Every time we say, I'm, I'm tired of doing this. Every time we say, I don't want to tell that person about salvation. Every time we make a decision to deny Christ, it's because apparently we just don't care enough about Jesus to do it. And yet, look what He did for us. carrying his cross to Mount Calvary and he can't even finish carrying the cross so they had to get somebody from the crowd to come over and help him. Jesus was willing to take this death because of His love for you and His love for me. All that pain, all that suffering that He endured, He did it for us. And this is why salvation is only through the blood of Jesus Christ. 
It's not through baptism. It's not through good works. You can't buy your way with money. Just because you throw a $20 bill in the offering plate doesn't mean that you're buying your way to heaven. God don't accept money to get to heaven. It takes the blood of Jesus Christ. You can't join an organization. You can't join a church to get to heaven. It is only through the blood of Jesus Christ. It is a gift of God. And that's why you have to accept that gift in order to get to heaven. It is only through Him. The blood that was shed at the cross is what forgives us of our sin. It is where our victory in our trials is found at. It's through the blood. It's how lives are changed. And it's all because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to make sure that we understand Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as He stood before the sinners, and we're all saying, crucify Him. Let that murderer go, but crucify Jesus. <laughs> I want us to understand that, you know, we hear people say, well, Seems to me if he was really the Son of God, they, he wouldn't have got killed. They wouldn't have murdered him. They wouldn't have been able to put him on that cross. If he was a Son of God, I mean, couldn't he have gotten away? Even the men right here that we just read, they were walking by him, mocking him, saying, well, if you're the Son of God, come down from the cross and we'll believe you. Well, if you can really do all this, then call upon your God. Call upon the Father and, and see if he'll help you now. So they're already mocking him. And he still stayed there. And, he, and not only did he still stay there, but he also said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And then we get mad at people because they do a little tiny thing to us. And they're nailing him to a cross, and he says, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. So people... People want to say things like, well, if, if he's really the Son of God, then how could they have killed him? How did they murder him? Well, it says in Luke 23, 46, Jesus said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And in John 19, 30, Jesus said, it is finished. Jesus is hanging on the cross when it's all finished. And He said, Father, I'm giving you my spirit. He said three little words. He said, it is finished. And the Bible says, He yielded up the ghost. That tells us they thought they killed him. They thought they murdered him. They thought that they were having control of the whole situation. But the reality of it is, is when Jesus said, Father, I give you my spirit, when he said it is finished and he yielded up the ghost, that tells us that in his own death, he was still in control. He was still in charge. We might have thought, all those people that put him there might have thought, yeah, we got him now. Look what we did. It was only God's will for that to happen. And that's why it did happen. Jesus was in control of His own death. When He knew the time was right, He said, it is finished. And He yielded up the ghost. So we need to understand Jesus Christ, even though He faced that horrible death and He was nailed to a cross, it was the will of God and it was to happen and He was still in control and that's why I just find it even more amazing that He stood there and listened and took all the mocking, the spitting, the beating and He knew, He knew that He was in control and what the outcome of this whole thing would be and yet He still took it for us. That He didn't call upon the angels of heaven to come down and whisk him away back into heaven. Now, he didn't drop the cross down and just go on and say, I don't have time for all this, kind of like we do with him. 
He was still willing to do all that for us. And then three days after His death, Jesus walked out of the tomb. That's why we celebrate Easter. This victory over death is where we have our true victory. When we call upon the name of Jesus to save us, we too can overcome death. We may die in the flesh, we might die in this body, but when we are saved and we called upon His name to be born again, we will have life everlasting. So where is Jesus today? Today He sits at the right hand of God and we see in 1 Peter 3.22 Who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto Him. So today He sitteth at the right hand of the Father and what is He doing there? He is making intercession for you and for me. He is the go-between. He is the mediator between us and God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And then we see in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus who gave Himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So, today, and that's why, that's why our cross is empty. That's why we don't have a cross with Jesus hanging on it, the crucifixion, because He's not there anymore. Today, He's alive. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. So that's why we see an empty cross, because He's alive. He's not there anymore. That was in the past. He's already did that. He will never have to face death again. And surely the way that He faced it uh, when He came to this earth, He'll never ever have to face that again. So today, I want to make sure that not only you are saved and born again, but I want to make sure that you are also truly serving Him with all of your heart. Everything that He has done for us deserves our service to Him. And remember, someday as we stand before God giving account of our lives to Him, the last thing that you want to hear Jesus say to the Father is, I never knew Him. Can you imagine standing before God in judgment? And we think that we're Christians and to hear Jesus say to the Father, I never knew Him. And then to think that Jesus would say to us, depart from me. I never knew you. That's scary. We better make sure that we're born again serving God. That we're yielded to Him. Because see, when you're truly born again, when you're truly saved, you're going to want to serve God. Because that change takes place in the heart because the Holy Spirit comes in. So let me ask you today, are you serving God today? I mean, just, that, just this little bit that we talked about, just now seeing what Jesus did for us. That just, it gets real hard for me to imagine and, and, and just think about all that pain and suffering that He endured for us. And then to think that we're just not doing anything for Him. That just really, that really bothers me. It gets to me. So, I just want to ask you today in closing. Are you serving God? After hearing this little bit that He did for us, are you truly serving God the best of your ability? Are, are you sold out to Him? Christ died for the church. Are you living for the church? Are you doing everything to protect the church? Are you letting your testimony shine for the world to see? Are you winning others to the Lord? Are you biting them to church? Are you doing everything, the things that God expects us to do as a Christian? If God laid on your heart to do something, have you done it? Do you keep putting it off? Is there something that the Lord spoke to you about doing, but 
you haven't done it yet. There's things I'm thinking about right now that the Lord's laid on my heart and I'm asking myself, have I done it all? I mean, there's so many things that when God tells us to do something, we have to react to it. We have to do it. Just like, just like building that ark, moving with fear. When Noah built that ark, he moved with fear and he did it because he had a fear of the Lord and that's where we need to be in our Christian life. If God says to do something, then just do it. So, I want to have the invitation, give the people online an opportunity to accept Christ if they have not done that. And while we're doing that, just bow your heads and close your eyes and just just think in your, in your heart. Just, just think about what Jesus Christ did for you when He left the heavens and He came to this earth and He gave everything up and the pain and the suffering that He took on so that we could have a way to eternal life and where He's at today making intercession for us. And just ask yourself, am I doing everything that I can do to serve Him to the best of my ability? And let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart about that. For those that are watching the online ministry, I just want to say, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you can do that today. You heard what He did for you to have salvation. The love that God has for you that He would give His only Son to die for our sins. So I want to give you that opportunity to accept Christ. If you'll follow me in this simple prayer. Dear Lord, I come to You today. I know that You died for my sin. I know that You arose on the third day. Today, I accept you into my heart to be my personal Savior. Lead and guide me every day of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that simple prayer, the Bible says you've been born again. If you'll contact us on the ministry page, we will do everything we can to help you find a church and, and help you start that new walk with Christ. Now for everybody here, if we'll stand